So thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak at your neonatal symposium. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be um, here virtually, and I hope that the virtual format uh, of uh, uh, this presentation uh, will still generate uh, some uh, interesting uh, questions during the uh, question answer period. Uh, so uh, my presentation today will be about um, a uh, hopefully uh, breakthrough uh, for neonatology uh, with the use of uh, cell therapies uh, to uh, curb uh, complications of extreme uh, prematurity. And uh, this is a major challenge uh, for a neonatologist uh, because um, we have made uh, tremendous progress uh, over the past uh, decades and have pushed back the limits of uh, viability so that today uh, preterm infants born around uh, 23, 24 weeks uh, gestation uh, survive. But uh, as a consequence, uh, we made the challenge of protecting ever more immature organs bigger. And uh, in a sense, we are the victims of our own success. Um, this slide shows very clearly how uh, from uh, 37 weeks uh, back to 23 weeks, uh, you can see that um, uh, major uh, organs, including the lung and the brain, are still uh, developing and um, uh, preterm birth exposes them early on to extra uterine life and uh, other adverse uh, events. And so clearly, major breakthroughs will need to happen uh, to make uh, a significant uh, impact on curbing the complications of extreme um, prematurity. And uh, in this presentation, I will uh, show you the long uh, adventurous journey from uh, discovery uh, to um, con proof of concept studies in uh, rodent experimental models to large animal models and how these findings then can be translated into clinical trials. But this translation often fails. And uh, this is where we have developed what we call the incubator concept that we'll expose here, uh, whose goal is to um, accelerate, but also enhance the success of uh, clinical translation of uh, disruptive uh, technologies. And one of this uh, disruptive technology was described over 50 years ago. It was the discovery of stem cells by Till and McCulloch, uh, Canadian researchers uh, that uh, had for the first time described stem cells, uh, which are cells that can uh, replicate indefinitely and under the right circumstances can become any type of cell. And at the time, the cell that Till and McCulloch had described was the hematopoietic uh, stem cell, the cell that, that can give rise to all the blood cells in, in our body. And um, next uh, to this um, hematopoietic stem cell uh, that is uh, located in the bone marrow, in the 70s, Another researcher described niche cells that were important for the nurturing and the function and the function of these uh, hematopoietic stem cells. These cells were called at that time colony forming unit fibroblast because they looked like fibroblast and they were capable of forming colonies. And they also had the ability to um, differentiate under certain circumstances into fat cartilage or bone. So to some extent, they could be qualified as uh, stem cells. However, discoveries around the uh, turn of the century showed that these colony unit formed fibroblasts when injected into mice with myocardial infarct could um, improve cardiac function. And uh, this immediately led to an exponential uh, publication record of these mesenchymal stromal cells of how they were then subsequently called uh, uh, that were tested in um, many, many lung um, disease models 
showing that indeed they may have some uh, therapeutic potential. And the excitement around these cells was so important uh, that the um, International Society for Cellular Therapy uh, tried to implement minimal uh, criteria to define uh, these uh, intriguing cells, and they called them mesenchymal stromal cells. And you can see that the, the criteria of these cells are still quite rudimentary. They has to be plastic adherent, multipotent, meaning they can become bone, cartilage, and fat. And they express certain uh, cell surface markers that allow us to identify whether we have the right cells. But uh, there is still some uh, controversy around the definition of these so-called mesenchymal stromal cells or MSCs. Nonetheless, in uh, animal models, including uh, animal models mimicking neonatal diseases, uh, there have been some very promising um, results with these mesenchymal stromal cells. In particular, uh, these cells seem to have multiple i.e. pleiotropic effects um, that um, uh, may explain uh, why they might be useful in uh, treating complications of prematurity, including bronchopulmonary dysplasia, the chronic lung disease, and preterm infants. And here you can see, uh, summarized in this illustration, some effects that these uh, mesenchymal stromal cells may exert. Uh, they um, promote, in addition to lung repair, uh, they promote the blood vessel formation, they attenuate inflammation, uh, they can um, be antioxidative, so attenuating uh, the injury due to oxygen that we provide to preterm infants, um, but they also may have lung uh, um, growth promoting um, effects, uh, which <clears throat> would be uh, for the first time uh, a therapy has this um, uh, effect. And these uh, pleiotropic effect targeting multiple uh, disease mechanisms leading to um, BPD uh, have been explored in experimental models. The uh, widespread uh, model used by investigators is exposing newborn rats or mice to high oxygen concentrations uh, from birth uh, for a certain period of time uh, postnatally up to 14, sometimes 21 days. And you can see that uh, when we take a lung slice, um, we can see a normal uh, dense alveolar network and um, likewise a dense lung vascular uh, network here used with several techniques. Conversely, when we expose these mice or rats to high oxygen concentrations, we get a arrest in alveolar development with large and very simplified alveoli, as well as a dramatic decrease in lung vascular growth. And these two features can be seen in humans with BPD and explain the poor gas exchange in the BPD lung. And this model is very useful to um, acquire proof of concept that a given therapy may be promising. And we can inject mesenchymal stromal cells either as a prophylactic approach or as a rescue approach after established lung injury. Here I show you the first two um, experiments um, performed with these mesenchymal stromal cells. Uh, in this experiment, MSCs were given directly through the airways. And you can see, compared to our BPD model, how MSCs were able to prevent alveolar injury as well as partially prevent the arrest in lung vascular growth. In another um, study, investigators injected mesenchymal stromal cells intravenously and uh, were able to show the same structural improvements in the lung, but they were also able to show 
that the lung influx of inflammatory cells such as macrophages or neutrophils were reduced when uh, mesenchymal stromal cells uh, were used, suggesting that indeed these mesenchymal stromal cells may attenuate lung inflammation. In both these experiments, um, rat or mouse bone marrow derived mesenchymal stromal cells were used. But from a clinical relevance uh, perspective, uh, there is another source that may be my, much more interesting uh, for uh, neonatologists uh, and their patients. And it is the umbilical cord, the Wharton jelly, uh, that uh, um, contain, uh, that are a rich source of mesenchymal stromal cells. And after enzymatic digestion and culture uh, processing, uh, these uh, mesenchymal stromal cells uh, can be isolated in high numbers. And more interestingly, compared to bone marrow derived mesenchymal stromal cells, these cord derived mesenchymal stromal cells may have superior repair capacity. And here I show you an experiment now where human cord derived mesenchymal stromal cells were used, injected into uh, the uh, animal model that you are well familiar with now. And you can see, uh, compared again to our untreated BPD model, rats injected with human mesenchymal stromal cells had a lung structure that almost looked like uh, normal. Conversely, animals injected with control cells that uh, were human dermal neonatal fibroblasts had no uh, therapeutic effect, suggesting that uh, the result is specific to these mesenchymal stromal cells. Of course, one of the concerns when you inject cells uh, into an organism is uh, the potential risk of tumor formation. So here we um, injected animals at, uh, um, at birth and then let them survive up to six months, which is the equivalent of 20 to 30 years in humans, and then looked at, at their uh, organs and their lungs again. And here we performed whole body CT scans and were unable to detect any tumor formation. Um, more detailed histological analysis also revealed no uh, tumor formation. Then we had the animals run on a treadmill and you can see now six month old rats uh, exposed in the neonatal period to oxygen had a dramatic decrease in exercise capacity. Whereas those that were treated with MSCs in their neonatal period had almost normal exercise capacity. Also room air control housed animals that were treated with MSCs at birth had normal exercise capacity suggesting no impairment on, of MSCs on normal um, exercise uh, function. More interestingly, uh, when we look at the lungs now at six months of age, you can see untreated animals have the persistence in the rest of alveolar development, mirroring uh, clinical uh, data, suggesting that um, adult survivors of BPD can develop emphysema and never gain a normal lung function over time. Those mice, those rats that were treated with MSCs at birth had a persistent improvement in lung uh, structure. And also those normal control mice, that, the rats that were treated with MSCs had normal lung architecture suggesting persistent therapeutic benefit and relative safety in this animal model of these mesenchymal stromal cells. But when we look for these mesenchymal stromal cells in the lung, very few cells could be found, suggesting that uh, these mesenchymal stromal cells do not engraft and do not transform into lung cells to rebuild uh, their, the, the lungs. In fact, uh, they act via a so-called uh, paracrine effect. Indeed, these mesenchymal stromal cells get into the lungs and then orchestrate 
the repair process by producing and releasing um, biological active um, factors. And uh, it is now uh, uh, recognized that these mesenchymal stromal cells, in fact, release uh, nano vesicles uh, that uh, are called exosomes or small extracellular vesicles. And uh, every cell in the body um, releases these nano vesicles, and this is how they communicate uh, with the surrounding cells. So mesenchymal stromal cells do the same, but these uh, uh, nano vesicles may contain some um, bioactive factors that are capable of modulating the repair response. And here I will show you a series of experiments that uh, suggest uh, these um, findings. And this is a group in, in Boston again that uh, used a mouse model of hyperoxia. You can see here the classical arrest in alveolar development. And when uh, this group uh, uses bone marrow derived MSCs and extracts the exosomes only, and then provides these to the mouse uh, model. You can see uh, the dramatic uh, therapeutic effect of these um, uh, exosomes, suggesting that this indeed uh, these exosomes that uh, mediate the therapeutic effect of mesenchymal stromal cells. Here, we were interested in creating another model that more reliably mimics uh, BPD, uh, where we took uh, uh, mice, exposed them to LPS, which is an in inflammatory molecule to trigger inflammation in the lung. And then we uh, also mechanically ventilated for eight hours and 40% FiO2 uh, these uh, neonatal mice to create a ventilation induced uh, lung injury. And when we take uh, core-derived mesenchymal stromal cells and take just the conditioned media uh, that is free of mesenchymal stromal cells, we could show uh, that uh, compared to our uh, ventilation-induced lung injury model, conditioned media of these mesenchymal stromal cells that likely contain those nanovesicles or exosomes improve lung architecture. And we can quantify this by showing uh, that the uh, median intercept is closer to normal when we inject these animals with uh, conditioned media. Then we went uh, and so uh, then we extracted the actual nanovesicles or exosomes uh, from uh, this conditioned media and used only those exosomes. And similar to conditioned media, exosome improved lung structure whereas exosome-free conditioned media or placebo had no therapeutic effect, suggesting again once more that uh, it's the exosome fraction that exerts the therapeutic um, benefit. Then we went one step further uh, where uh, we uh, went back uh, to our oxygen model, but also used uh, um, the same experiments in the uh, ventilation model that I just exposed to you. And uh, instead of uh, looking just at the lungs, we also wanted to look at the brain of these animals because we know that severe BPD is an independent risk factor for uh, adverse neurodevelopmental outcome. But the reasons for this are unknown. And so here we were able to show in this animal model that, uh, of course, there's the um, typical arrest in alveolar, de alveolar development. But then we also looked at the brain stem cells in those animals. And our hypothesis was that these brain stem cells are impaired in a BPD model. And then we treated these animals with MSC derived exosomes. This slide shows that compared to control animals, there were way fewer um, uh, SOX2 and nestin positive brain progenitor cells uh, in the hyperoxia uh, model, suggesting some injury uh, to the brain in this animal uh, model. And when we then isolate the neural progenitor cells, so the brain stem cells, and uh, replate them, uh, we can see that they were 
incapable in forming primary or secondary neurospheres, which is one of the critical functions of these um, uh, neuroprogenitor cells. Uh, they are not as capable as, um, as um, to self-renew compared to normal uh, neuroprogenitor cells. And then when we expose these um, animals to um, exosomes, we were capable of partially restoring the function of these neuroprogenitor cells. So here, unlike dexamethasone, which is a potent anti-inflammatory uh, medication, uh, but that has uh, adverse uh, effects on brain cells, these mesenchymal stromal cells and what they release seem to be neuroprotective. With the same um, reasoning in mind, uh, we uh, developed a neonatal sepsis model uh, to uh, explore the effects of uh, mesenchymal stromal cells in this model. Here again, we know that the uh, dexamethasone, uh, again, very efficient in attenuating inflammation, also increases the risk of sepsis in our preterm infants. Here, uh, we were pleased to see that in this uh, neonatal sepsis model, uh, those animals treated with umbilical cord MSCs had improved uh, survival compared to untreated animals. Likewise, bacterial clearance was enhanced with uh, amazing chimal stromal cells. And uh, these um, uh, effect may be explained by the fact that amazing chimal stromal cells release uh, antimicrobial substances. Here we measured LL37. Uh, which may uh, explain the beneficial effect of uh, our mesenchymal stromal cell therapy. So here, mesenchymal stromal cells seem to be uh, effective in uh, preventing uh, death from uh, sepsis and ac uh, actively promoting bacterial clearance. So in summary, I showed you um, 15 years of uh, research uh, in this field um, at the bench, uh, suggesting that uh, mesenchymal stromal cells isolated from the bone marrow or human umbilical cord can effectively uh, prevent several complications of extreme prematurity. I showed you the beneficial effects on sepsis, brain injury, and BPD. Uh, other investigators also uh, um, looked at MSCs and necrotizing enterocolitis. And I also um, showed you that these amazing hamostromal cells do not engraft, but they act via paracrine effect uh, through the release of these um, extracellular vesicles that contain several potent repair proangiogenic antioxidative factors. Uh, that uh, exert similar beneficial effect than mesenchymal stromal cells. Yeah, here are a series of um, systematic reviews uh, that uh, summarize uh, these um, data. And if you're interested, you should also read this uh, interesting uh, editorial uh, on the about the controversy of uh, mesenchymal uh, stromal cells to put things a little bit into perspective. And this is what um, we also um, uh, tried and I will present in the next uh, 15 minutes. Because of course, when you see these preclinical data, the excitement is, uh, is, is very high and uh, has already prompted the clinical translation of mesenchymal stromal cells. Here I show you uh, the um, early phase clin clinical trials that have been performed, phase one trials, looking at feasibility and safety of uh, this approach. Uh, this is a group in uh, South Korea that uh, took cord blood derived mesenchymal stromal cells. It's a proprietary product. They injected these cells intratracheally at a low and a high dose. And uh, Patients were around 25 weeks uh, gestation, and the timing of the injection was around 10 days of age. And the results of this um, study showed the feasibility and absence of toxicity of this uh, therapy. Uh, 
these authors also published 18 month to two year follow up confirming absence of toxicity of these mesenchymal stromal cells. A group in Chicago used the same proprietary M MSC product and uh, had a similar clinical trial design uh, leading to similar conclusions about the feasibility and absence of toxicity. And uh, so this has now uh, prompted a phase two clinical trial that was just uh, published uh, this year uh, in uh, this uh, trial, again, by the South Korean group using these mesenchymal stromal uh, cord blood derived cells. Uh, 66 preterm infants were uh, randomized to either placebo or uh, mesenchymal stromal cells. And uh, there was no difference in the primary outcome, death or BPD. In the subgroup analysis, looking at the youngest uh, um, infants, 23 to 24 weeks gestation, uh, there seemed to be uh, a signal that the mesenchymal stromal cell treated infants had a lower incidence of BPD, but um, these are small numbers and no conclusions can be drawn from them. But uh, of course, the results of this trial now prompted another phase two trial that is currently ongoing in uh, the smallest of uh, the preterm infants uh, to see if MSCs can have a therapeutic benefit. However, as I uh, hinted to uh, in uh, my introduction, the clinical translation of potentially life-saving therapies is unacceptably slow, but also often fails. And uh, the um, evidence uh, is provided here. Uh, this is one uh, citation that clearly um, uh, highlights uh, the limitations in our success of translating uh, discoveries from the bench uh, to the bedside. And this is the reason why we implemented this um, incubator concept, um, which is an, an acronym. And you can see here the um, multidisciplinary aspect of our team that includes, for example, a health psych psychologist and a health uh, economist um, to assess uh, various factors uh, to mitigate the risk in translating MSCs, for example, into patients. And so here again, the preclinical studies um, I showed you uh, have already led to the clinical translation, but here in uh, the interface between preclinical studies and clinical trials, we have inserted this incubator concept and it includes amongst others, preclinical and clinical systematic reviews early parent engagement with integrated knowledge translation, early economic evaluation, but also retro and prospective cohort studies before embarking into expensive clinical trials. So here I will show you um, two examples of uh, this uh, incubator um, concept. Uh, the first one is a systematic review. You're all familiar with um, uh, systematic reviews for clinical trials to summarize uh, in an evidence-based fashion uh, the uh, current knowledge that exists on a topic. Here, we use the same rigorous technique uh, used in systematic reviews and meta-analysis to study all preclinical experimental mesenchymal stromal studies in experimental models of BPD. And so um, Sajid Augustine, a fellow in our unit, screened through 1,000 um, um, files and was able uh, to uh, retain 25 uh, publications uh, for the uh, uh, quantitative uh, analysis. And here, this is a typical forest plot uh, of a uh, systematic review meta-analysis. And um, it shows very clearly that in terms of lung structure, mesenchymal stromal cells in almost all studies, except for three, uh, was able uh, to improve uh, lung uh, structure. Uh, 
So this is a very clear cut um, result. But when you look at the risk of bias, you can see that there are major limitations in the interpretation and the experimental design of these um, uh, preclinical um, studies, suggesting that um, the research should be uh, more rigorous at the bench side because they will form the rationale for moving into clinical trials. And so to enhance the rigor of our preclinical research, uh, the ARRIVE guidelines and other guidelines uh, were uh, set uh, forth. And uh, these um, um, guidelines are now reinforced by um, editors of scientific uh, journals. Uh, and it um, enables those preclinical studies to become more rigorous, similar to um, clinical trials. Another important information that uh, arose from the systematic review was that all in all 25 papers, uh, the model, the exclusive model used was the rodent model. And so here uh, we wanted to go one step further and uh, had the privilege to work with um, uh, the only facility uh, in the world in San Antonio, Texas, that um, uh, has a, a non-human uh, primate model uh, that is very close to the clinical uh, scenario, providing critical information for regulatory agencies uh, to um, enable the uh, uh, clinical trial of these, um, of these therapies. So here, uh, uh, non-human primates are delivered prema uh, prematurely at the equivalent age of a 24-weeker. Uh, these uh, baboons can be intubated, uh, receive uh, catheters for intravenous injection, and then ventilated for two weeks straight. So here uh, we uh, took advantage of this unique uh, model uh, to uh, test uh, the uh, feasibility of uh, mesenchymal stromal cell administration, uh, whether there is any infusional toxicity or toxicity over the two-week uh, um, um, period that these um, uh, animals are ventilated and cared for. And then we were able to look at the lung structure. Uh, so there were very um, insightful um, information uh, gathered by this model. Uh, one uh, important one uh, was the absence of uh, mesenchymal stromal cell engraftment in the lung, spleen, or liver. And here we used actually forensic methods to confirm the absence of um, mesenchymal stromal cell engraftment, which is important for uh, the safety of this um, cell uh, therapy. Then uh, we want, asked the question, uh, to parents and neonatal colleagues whether um, or what, how they felt about giving stem cells to um, babies. And um, this was an important um, study uh, because it allowed us to, uh, one, um, engage the parents and the clinical colleagues early on in the um, clinical design, um, but also to learn about potential obstacles and facilitators of doing a stem cell trials in uh, vulnerable preterm infants. And so here we interviewed parents that had uh, um, babies between 22 and 28 weeks gestation hospitalized in the NICU. Uh, we also interviewed uh, clinical uh, colleagues across uh, uh, Canada. Uh, and uh, ask a series of uh, uh, questions that were um, designed with a health uh, psychologist. Uh, here is a um, summary of uh, some of the barriers and uh, enablers that uh, were identified uh, through uh, these uh, questionnaires. And uh, very interestingly, uh, we felt that uh, the development of an animated informational video for parents, uh, easily accessible on a tablet, uh, would be very helpful in enhancing the um, information provided to parents and as a consequence, uh, 
the enrollment of uh, patients in studies. And uh, failure to enroll is often a reason why uh, clinical trials actually um, fail. And so here, I just show you a snapshot of uh, what is an animated um, um, video uh, where uh, we uh, have these um, um, typical schematics uh, that explain uh, what uh, premature birth means, what the co potential complications are, such as bronchopulmonary dysplasia, and um, what uh, a, a mesenchymal stromal cell is, what the rationale is uh, for uh, proposing them uh, to prevent bronchopulmonary dysplasia, and the whole process uh, with um, regulatory agencies and uh, research ethics boards um, to allow uh, the um, moving forward with a phase one trial. And we also explained the concept of a phase one trial testing feasibility and safety of this approach. And so this video was tested uh, in an observational cohort uh, that will lead to uh, a phase one trial uh, that we call uh, the uh, Hulk uh, helping underdeveloped uh, cells, uh, lungs with cells. And here again, it's a multidisciplinary team of uh, clinical trialists, epidemiologists, of course, a clinical research um, assistant, and good manufacturing um, procedure facility that makes uh, clinical grade um, cells. And so here is the <clears throat> experimental design of this uh, trial. So we start with an observational cohort that has uh, the same inclusion criteria as for our interventional cohort. Babies have to be born between uh, before 28 weeks gestation, uh, be still intubated and mechanically ventilated at uh, day seven to 21 of uh, life. These are babies that are at high risk of developing BPD. Uh, then uh, we um, were uh, sampling blood and tracheal aspirates for markers of inflammation, uh, recorded the clinical course of these um, patients, and uh, tested our informational video uh, in, uh, with those um, parents. None of these babies were injected with mesenchymal stromal cells. And the rationale, again, for this observational cohort was to make sure uh, that uh, our experimental protocol uh, was appropriate. Uh, and so it served as a run-in phase for our team and the data safety monitoring committee to gain experience in enrolling patients prior to initiating the interventional cohort. And so this in, uh, observation cohort was completed uh, three weeks ago, and uh, we are preparing now the interventional cohort where we plan on um, uh, testing these uh, amazing caramel stromal cells in a dose escalation scheme uh, of low, mid, and high dose. And hopefully uh, this um, cohort will allow us to determine the maximum feasible dose uh, that we would then test in a subsequent phase two trial. The endpoints are all focused on feasibility and uh, safety uh, with the immediate safety uh, of uh, amazing chymostromal cell injection and then a longer term uh, safety um, uh, looking at, uh, of course, respiratory parameters and um, then also gathering pro-inflammatory cytokines and again, testing our animated information video. So despite uh, the rapid progress of this uh, technology and uh, the um, uh, accumulation of early phase clinical trial, we have to um, accept that these uh, cell-based uh, therapies are still in its infancy. And um, uh, the analogy to the cell phone evolution is, I think, uh, very insightful uh, because here from uh, the um, development of the very first uh, cell phone that did one thing, uh, making a call, uh, to 
the um, implementation of the first uh, iPhone in 2007, it took 25 years for these developmental stages to occur. And this is just technology. So one can imagine how long biotechnology in cell therapy, for example, uh, will uh, take. And the analogy with the cell phone development is um, uh, pertinent here because uh, for a cell um, therapy, uh, it requires cell manufacturing. And so the process is the product. And so here I have illustrated <clears throat> schematically what it takes uh, to make a mesenchymostromal cell. So you can um, isolate uh, the cells from either bone marrow or uh, the umbilical cord. Then you have to enzymatically and mechanically digest the cells, expand them, uh, and then uh, store them and uh, freeze them. And then ultimately they can be thawed and then injected into patients. Um, you can see that, for example, uh, these cells could become uh, uh, genetically modified to enhance their function. Uh, the question is whether we should freeze the cells or whether we should uh, provide them fresh. Or if we froze them uh, and thaw them, uh, should we uh, culture them for another 24, 48 hours before administration to patients? And so you can see that all these different steps in the process uh, will affect uh, the function and the efficacy of these cells, and as a consequence, the results of the clinical trial. So we're really um, at the beginning of uh, cell-based therapies, and much more needs to be learned about the biology of these mesenchymal stromal cells, their definition, their mechanism of action. Um, it's important that there's a biological plausibility and a strong clinical rationale uh, for initiating uh, clinical trials. Um, and while we're still in this learning phase, I think that the time is right for well-designed, carefully designed early phase clinical trials, because they will teach us a lot about how these cells uh, behave and how we can improve uh, cell-based uh, therapies. We also hope that uh, the um, incubator concept uh, will allow uh, for a improved evidence-based uh, and um, uh, timely uh, translation of these disruptive uh, therapies um, into uh, the, the clinic. And with this, I would like to thank all the people behind the bench work for mesenchymal cells that have made Hulk a reality. And you can see why we're so excited about this incubator concept, because we have more um, projects in the pipeline that we hope will see the light in the clinic over the next uh, five years with um, endothelial progenitor cells or a gene therapy uh, for a rare but lethal uh, lung disease uh, called surfactant protein B um, uh, deficiency. And I would also like to thank the um, funding agencies that have made this uh, work um, possible. And I look uh, forward to um, answering uh, your questions. Thank you very much uh, for your attention.